how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. To infinity and beyond! Some people without brains do an awful lot of talking, don't they? It's classified. You talking to me? I could tell you, but then I'd have to kill you. I can't lie! Expecto Patronum! Entertainment X. You never know what you're going to get. For this conversation, I get to sit down with Ken Davenport, and we cover a lot of topics. We talk about how he got his start in producing, common misconceptions of producers, uh, advice that he would give to artists in terms of money and finance, and a whole bunch more. This is a wonderful, wide-ranging conversation, which is actually packed right down to 40 minutes. So, I hope you enjoy this episode, and keep on keeping on. We are back, and today with me is Ken Davenport. Ken, thank you for making time to do this. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Much appreciated. Of course. I want to start with growing up. What did you want to be? Well, I wanted to be a lot of things. I wanted to be an FBI agent, a computer yes. programmer, a spy. I mean, you name it, I wanted to be it, which is why I, I started to get involved in the theater because, of course, the theater allows you to be anything you want on any given day. So true. Uh, that was my application, actually, to Juilliard when I applied uh, as an actor, and I did not get in. Okay. So... We know how that went. Okay, okay. So when did you make the decision to switch over to producing? At what age? Well, it was late. You know, I got involved with theater when I was a little kid, when I was five. I did it until I was about 12 as an actor. Then I got too cool for it, thought I was going to play for the Boston Red Sox and the Celtics simultaneously, like I was going (laughs) to be that kid. And then I got put on the path like so many people do, I think, out there in the world. I was going to be a lawyer. I went to a small college prep school in Central Mass, and... We churned out doctors and lawyers. That's what we did. And L.A. Law was a big hit on television at the time. And I was like, I like these guys. I'm going to be a lawyer like them. Yeah. That's what people do. And um, it wasn't until my senior year of high school that I got rebit by the theater bug when I saw Les Mis. Mm. I'm 45 years old. I consider myself part of what I call the Les Mis generation. Mm. There's a whole group of us out there that are in the business <laughs> today yeah. because of that show. So... Uh, I went to Johns Hopkins University. I was going to be a lawyer. I transferred right away because I had been rebit by the bug. Mm-hmm. Uh, went to Tisch at NYU, still going to be an actor. And it wasn't until I, my junior year when I was recommended to be a production assistant on My Fair Lady, this revival with Richard Chamberlain, that I was ex- exposed to the other side of the business. Uh, and I was attracted to it in a way that was I mean, even more so than performing. And that's when I knew, oh, I'm going to. I'm going to start exploring these opportunities for 10 I, I did everything at that point. Again, just like wanting to be an FBI agent or a computer programmer or whatever. Yeah. I stage managed. I worked for a casting director for a little while. I worked for an agent trying to find my way. For 10 years, I was a company manager and general manager for Broadway shows, mm. um, all the while coming up with ideas for shows that I might want to create. And then in 2004, I started producing on my own. Now, were you writing, actively writing shows at that point or participating in writing shows or did that come a little bit later? I've been a writer since I was a kid or, you know, I, it's funny, obviously I write, right. And, uh, but at the same time, that's not really what I think of myself doing. Mm. I think of myself as an idea generator and Mm. I then execute ideas. And sometimes that involves writing them. Sometimes that involves just getting other people in a room and saying, I have an idea, do, do this Mm. because you're much better at performing and on a stage or in front of a camera. Uh, so, or sometimes I have an idea about a board game, you know, we created a board game. Yeah. And um, so that's what I think I, I do. And then, yeah, sometimes I will sit down and write them, but I've been doing that since I, I've been writing or creating things since I was a kid. Uh, and then, so when I started thinking, oh, I want to, you know, I, I consider myself an entrepreneur just in the art space. So when I started thinking about ideas or shows that I wanted to see, Hmm. I just started to put those together. And sometimes that means writing them and sometimes that means other people writing them. That's so true. As a kid, were you uh, creating these ideas like at your level of like elementary school or high school, lemonade stands and what have you? Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I had a candy shop in my father's yes, you did. cardiologist <laughs> office. He was a oh doctor, like heart patients, and I was yeah. selling them chocolate <laughs> bars. 
uh, yeah, of course, we put on plays in my parents' living room. Yeah. I wrote a short film. Uh, I was, as an actor, as a kid, I was asked to be in a film. And I was so like, oh, this is interesting. So I went back and wrote one that I still have somewhere. Oh, wow. I wrote, and this is interesting, the combination of me as a writer of drama or creator of drama and also a marketer. I wrote a commercial for Converse that I sent in to Converse as like a 10 year old, I think, or 11 year old. Uh, and actually they wrote back. That's too yeah, it was funny. A, it was amazing. I wrote a whole thing about, I was a big Larry Bird, Boston Celtics fan. I wrote a whole yeah. like celebrity sneaker ad featuring <laughs> me really yeah, 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 and Larry Bird. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Did they use it? Or they just wrote back to you? No, I got that? very like, oh, such creativity. We can't use anyone's ideas but our ad agencies type oh, of thing. Yeah. And then the marketer yeah. me was like, you idiots. Because you could have gotten so much attention from using a 10-year-old's ad. For real. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, companies do that too. They'll use... I mean, what was Got Milk did something like that? There's different companies that have done. Yeah, that. it was ahead of its time in a yeah. way because now they Doritos has like a make your own commercial challenge, yes. like all these yes. things. Uh, and this was in 1982. You know? Before that, yeah, before computers in everyone's homes. For real, that's so that's so true. What did your parents teach you about work ethic? So I, you know, my parents got divorced when I was five, and. My, my mom got remarried when I was 10 and she married the two most different men on the planet. And in a crazy way, you know, a lot of people might say, oh, my parents got divorced. It's so sad. It was difficult. My parents' divorce and my mom's remarriage was such a blessing. And I actually wouldn't be as successful as I am today, whatever that means and mm -hmm. where I want to go tomorrow, uh, if it wasn't for the fact that my parents got divorced and my mom got remarried. Why do you think that is? My my father is uh, a doctor and an Indian doctor. So he's part of that generation of Indians that came over in the 60s yeah. and was told, be a doctor, go to med school in India, and then uh, go to the States if you want to have a successful life. So uh, educated, learned man, but immigrant. Mm -hmm. So came to this country, didn't know anybody, just had a medical license and had to adapt to this country and everything about it and then uh, build a business mm -hmm. as a physician. Yeah. My mom remarried a man who didn't graduate high school, who started his own company, a construction company, uh, and through his relationships and hard work and sweat and driving around in his pickup truck every single day and still to this day at 82 years of age, going to work at five o'clock in the morning every morning. Wow. Um, I learned the two like incredible work ethic. One, education, building a business, a professional, quote unquote. Mm. And then someone about it's hard work and sweat and toil and so much education occurs on the street, not in a classroom. Yeah. That's very true. How about kindness? Yeah, my, you know, the interesting thing about my dad is that he's an old school doctor, you know, as so many doctors were about volume and creating 16 different cubicles in their office so they could see 16 patients at a time. Wow. My dad was about sitting with a patient and talking about their life and everything that was going on in it which how that contributed to their health and he would spend a lot of time and cost himself a lot of money um, just because he wanted to be kind to people on the street and that also I think is about where he came from yeah. you know he came from another country which didn't have a lot of wealth um, and people needed things and he here as a physician was always willing to to help out yeah yeah it's a human connection that really does wonders for your, <laughs> your practice or your company uh, what's your favorite part of producing shows my favorite part of producing shows is actually going to see them but I don't I can't go to see them all the time it's uh, or sit through them all the time as much as I would like to yeah so what I do often is I go to the last five minutes mm -hmm. and what I do is I watch but I actually don't watch what's happening on the stage usually what I do is I turn and watch the audience so my favorite thing to do is to watch as a curtain comes down lights come up and and see that audience and look at the joy on their faces or the tears in their eyes. You know, I do this at Once on this Island a lot because the end of that show, people are so affected by it. I do it at Kinky Boots a lot because it's fantastic seeing tourists, like a group of guys from Nebraska, like jumping to their feet for a bunch of drag queens. It like just makes my heart warm. 
uh, getting the band back together, which is about to open, just seeing everyone having such a great time and cheering yeah. for those underdogs on stage. That's what it's about. It reminds me of how I was moved when I saw Les Mis when I was 16 years old. That's my job is to move an audience, to affect them. How has your taste changed with picking source material for production? You know, I, I think as a when I started in the business as a young man, it's all about like, oh, I wanted something so serious. I want to, you know, it's like you're so angsty as a teenager and young adult. And uh, my, it was a great lesson I got from uh, a guy named Chuck Abbott, uh, who's a director and ran a summer stock theater in Maine where I was an actor in 1993. And I was very serious. And he was like, relax, smile, have some fun. This is the theater. Yeah. Uh, and I'm all about that. I'm all about you know, joy now and, and, and inserting that everywhere. I say that that's the difference between musical theater mm -hmm. and dr drama, straight plays. The best example of that is the difference between Romeo and Juliet and West Side Story. Uh, Romeo and Juliet, at the end of it, both of them are dead. Mm -hmm. West Side Story, adaptation, only one of them is dead. Mm -hmm. And the other one basically says, can't we all just get along? Yeah. And I think that's what musicals have to do is they have to put a uh, one ray of sunshine at least or hope uh, at, at the end because that's what people want from them. Yeah. That, I remember that conversation with um, Jonathan Larson bringing, having Angel come back to life at the end of the show because they're like, it can't end. <laughs> with death <laughs> yeah well that was a the revel that was such a revolutionary moment in the evolution of modern musical theater because i remember seeing that and going like what a cliche she wakes up like mm. that's how deus ex machina is that i literally and i had been blown away by the show when i saw the original company blown away by it and for a moment i was like and then i went oh my god it's so brilliant because at the time Miss Saigon had come out. Les Mis, like all these big, heavy things. Like Miss Saigon, is, that's a depressing thing at the end of that show. And Jonathan was like, no, no, we're going we're gonna to turn this around and go back to what musicals are, are about, is putting a little joy and hope in things. Yeah, yeah. Starting out, what was your, how did you give yourself permission to create shows, to take that risk, to take that chance? I didn't really ask for myself for permission. I just, <laughs> the y you just do things, you, just you do know, it. I think that's it. You want to do something and you do something. You yeah. try to channel the, you know, I'm a, I have a 12 week old now and you try to channel the energy or ambition or desires of a child when you're an entrepreneur and it gets harder as you get older. It also gets harder by the way, the more success you have because you feel like there's more eyeballs on you, yeah. but children don't give a shit. <laughs> they just want something and they're going to do it. Yeah. They want, they just, if they want a lollipop and it's sitting there, even if it's in a store, they're just going to grab it. Right. And I think that's what our entrepreneurs and artists have to do is that if they want something, they want they have an idea. Oh, I would love to star in a one man show or write a one man show. Well, you just write the one man show. You don't think, just go and do it. oh, can I do this? Will people judge me? No, you just do it. You grab the lollipop. You just do whatever you want. Yeah. What was the beginning of thirteen for you? How did you jump into that project? So I had produced. Very specifically, I produced three off-Broadway shows before I started producing Broadway shows. And the reason is I didn't know anybody that could write million-dollar checks. I certainly couldn't do that myself. I had ideas. The three off-Broadway shows that I created were all began with ideas out of my head. And I wanted to execute them, and I wanted to call the shots. I didn't want to sit at a table with 20 other people and say, this is my idea, and let someone else run with it. Mm. I wanted, I knew the best way to learn was to grab the lollipop and just figure it out and just go for it. And so that's what I did. Then I said, okay, it's now time for me to produce Broadway shows. Even though I had managed Broadway shows for a number of years, I still wanted to learn from other people. So I raised some money to produce um, some other shows to co-produce. And 13 was the first one. I had a personal connection with it because Jason Robert Brown was a vocal coach of mine uh, in college. Okay. Uh, and I saw songs for New World when it was at 88, this piano bar downtown. 
um, and I knew Jason well, so I had an affinity for the material. I knew I could sell it well, quote unquote, to other people. Mm. Uh, so that was me just jumping in and saying, let me do this show. And it was very unique. If you, know, if you look at all the shows that I do, everything I do, shows or not, I look for things that are exceptionally unique because that's what stands out. And 13 was the first ever Broadway show that was all teenagers in the cast and the band. Mm. There wasn't an adult on stage. That for me is something that people can talk about. Yeah. Yeah. I want to bring up that there was a, a previous podcast interview I was listening to of you and it was a very interesting conversation. You, you were talking about coming up from the bottom with people like in all different fields, like make friends with the actors, the producers, the writers. So you guys are going to be the future. So come up together. So I think it's really interesting that you and Jason, you know, had done that together in a way because you guys both came up around the same time, which is so true because that is the future. I want to cover um, money, relationship with money, because I know money <laughs> makes the world go around. And particularly in producing shows, you need a lot of it. I'm kind of curious, your views on money, your relationship with it, maybe what advice you would give a college graduate on saving money. Is there anything that comes to mind that you would share on? The biggest thing I can say is that there is this cliche out there that you have to be a starving artist. This, oh, I'm struggling, starving artist. Like, it's like people wear it as a badge of honor. Yeah. And really, that should not be the case. You should not think about it. That money is actually okay. Yeah. It's really a good thing to have. People don't like to talk about that because it makes them, oh, that's so materialistic or greedy no. or yeah, something. It's, yeah. The fact is, if you have money, you can do more things that are good, whether it's give to charity, whether it's create a show and provide jobs for two people, never mind a hundred people. Like that's good. When you buy things from a store, it's good for the economy. It's good for that small business owner or whatever that is. Mm -hmm. So the, the thing that I tell people is don't be embarrassed about trying to make money because you can do good things with it. And that including create theater that makes money. Right. Um, you know, some people may, I don't know, some people not may say, Mama Mia, oh, what a commercial enterprise and blah, blah, blah. Well, OK, great. Well, it's generated one, a lot of income for a lot of people. And the producers have done a lot of good with that. So there's it's OK to I, I, I just wish people would get rid of this badge of honor that they wear of like, mm -hmm. I'm I'm a starving artist. Try not to be a, try to be a fat artist. Like that's what everyone's goal should be. <laughs> I love that. I absolutely love that. And I want to talk now about the, so congratulations. First of all, we talked about this a little before we started recording Tony award winner with uh, once on this Island. What a beautiful story. What a beautiful story. And it's so interesting to me, much like Saigon, a beautiful story. You don't, it's more difficult, I would imagine, correct me if I'm wrong, to get general audiences into those shows. It could be easier to get them into, well, maybe getting the band back together, which is so diverse because it's, and we were saying this before, it really appeals to me. It appeals to the, the Meadowland crowd, people going to see Springsteen. But I saw, I saw the show, uh, I don't know, was it three weeks ago? And it's got so much heart as well. And then you have the play that goes wrong, which is just my stomach hurts at the end of it from laughing. So it's so diverse. And I'm so interested. I mean, I imagine that was done on purpose to have diverse content on Broadway. Uh, is there anything that you want to share on that? Well, I, again, I, I look for things that are, provide very unique experiences. You know, someone said to me recently, oh, do you do plays? And I was like, not really. I don't do plays. And, and someone had to remind me that I'm producing a play that goes wrong. <laughs> and I said, oh, I don't really think of it as a play. It's such a unique experience. And yeah, it's, it's belly busting funny. Yeah. So, and Once in this Island, even look, Once in this Island was one of the very first shows I saw when I moved to New York, 1991. And the, I didn't just want to do, and Michael certainly didn't just want to do, another Once on this Island in a proscenium. If you go see ours, if you've seen it before, it's very different, unique, special. There's a goat, chickens, water, sand. There's everything about it. So everything I do is just very, very unique. And yeah, it's... So it can range across a wide Deaf West Spring Awakening. Again, another Michael Arden stroke of genius, mm -hmm. that show with hearing actors and deaf actors. 
uh, everything I do is is different, unique, special, which allows uh, a very diverse type of content. But in a way, it's all tied together by that one by that one thing. Mm. Is there a show you've produced to date that has taught you the most? Where you learned something from all of them, but are there standout lessons maybe from one of them? Spring Awakening is probably one of the most uh, was one of the most profound producing experience of of my life personally and professionally. One I w- was just gobsmacked by that production when I saw it. I loved the original, and then when I saw Michael's version, I just understood it so much more. And personally, I had never had a conversation with a deaf person before. And I was thrown into a very uncomfortable position and I had to deal with it and figure it out. And one of the best definitions of art that I've ever heard is art is meant to disturb. And it doesn't, disturb doesn't mean in a bad way. It doesn't just mean in a, like a horror movie way. It just means like knock you off your senses a little bit or off your rocker and just like, whoa, that I got to recalibrate. Yeah. Uh, and that's, I think, what great art does. And that's actually what I believe all experiences should do. They should just, whoa, I wasn't, that was a little outside of my comfort zone. That was a little different, but it makes me grow as a person and a professional. And that's what yeah. Spring Awakening did for me. Yeah. Do you go out of your way, maybe not out of your way regularly, do you find yourself putting yourself in uncomfortable situations to grow or an uncomfortable position to grow? Yeah, you have to. I mean, it's the only way you do it. I mean, one of the, the, I heard this great quote from a CEO years ago where someone said, an interviewer like yourself said, oh, you've obviously learned how to conquer fear. Like you've gotten over that fear hurdle that so many of us, how did you do that? And the CEO responded with, are you kidding? I'm afraid all the time. Mm. It's when I'm afraid that I actually know I need to do it. Yeah. because I just need to see it through the end. It's like jumping out of a plane. You just have to trust that the parachute's going to open. And also, I produce shows. No one's going to live or die based on what happens. I am going to produce some great shows. I'm going to produce some shows that don't work. I'm going to produce some great shows that don't work. Mm. I'm going to produce some shows that I go on the curtain goes up, and I'm going to be like, boy, that missed And then it's going to sell really well. Like it just, Mm -hmm. you never really know. There's so much of this that's, that you can't control. You just have to go with your instincts, go with what you believe at that time and, and just keep going and keep doing it. Yeah. How did your relationship with the really useful group come about? Well, in, in a very, you know, unique insidery way, as you can imagine, Andrew Lloyd Webber is a pretty well connected guy. So when he, wants something or is interested in something uh he has his people and his people talk to pe- his people here <laughs> and yeah. sure enough yeah. a, 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 you know it I, I got a call one day from someone saying someone may be looking for somebody to do something <laughs> would you be interested and of course i mean as i was quoted you know that i think when it when it was released look when you know one of the greatest creators of musical theater calls and says, would you like to assist me in anything? You jump and just say, yeah, when, where, I'll, I'll do it. Of course. Just a phone call. That's, that's funny. I mean, that shows you how small the community really is. I want to touch on diversifying because not only are you producing shows, you have a board game, you have the podcast, you have the blog, you have your books. Was that a natural evolution? Or was there a conscientious decision to, hey, I should I should do some other things here? Well, I always knew, and th- there's been some of my peers have said this early that if you're going to solely be a producer and nothing else, that having additional revenue streams for businesses is important because you can't, especially nowadays, it's very hard to control when you produce hmm. because back in the days of David Merrick or and even after that. If you had a show, if you had a play and a musical and raise the money, you just walk down to the theater owners and say, I need a theater. And they'd say, OK, mm. well, that's just not possible now. There just aren't enough theaters to do that. So as I also looked at the models, I looked at other pro- independent producers and I was like, oh, all of them also have something else that they do that can support them or save their show's money or something. 
So I, that was part of it. And then the other part, which is the flaw part, to be honest, is that I have entrepreneurial ADD. So when I come up with an idea that I think is good, I grab the lollipop, I do it, which can scatter me a little bit. Mm. So yeah, that's why the board game, that's where the theater come in. I had a rehearsal space for a while. I have a, a lot of different things. All of that was about supporting the main core. But what I've learned later in my life is that you can spread yourself too wide and take your eye off the ball of what you want to do. So actually I've spent, it was just announced last week, I have a group sales company or I had a group sales company. I sold it last week and that's part of a new philosophy of mine was like, okay, that was my, you know, 20 somethings to 30 somethings. I'm in my forties now. Now the forties are about focus. So I'm starting to do away with some of the subsidiary stuff to really focus on what I want to do, which is create and produce Broadway musicals. Mm. Did you have any mentors growing up? I had a, a, a lot of them in a variety of ways. I actually have more now than I did. And one of the things that I, I would do differently is that seek out more earlier and like stick with them. I'm a guy that I can sit in front of my computer all alone at night and solve a problem. But I didn't realize that other people could help me uh, not only solve that problem, but introduce me to other people and do that. So Hal Prince was a mentor of mine. I worked with him three times. Uh, so that was just all the producers. I was a company manager for 10 years. So all the producers, whether they knew it or not, were mentors of mine because I watched and observed and stole a little piece of them in their style. Yeah. Is there common themes you see among successful producers, including yourself? <laughs> Anything that stands out? You know, one of the things that frustrates me the most is whenever there's a union negotiation that's not going so well, the, the unions will like jump up and down about the greed of the Broadway producer, Broadway producer than greed. And it actually makes me laugh. And I understand it's a tactic. There is no Broadway producer doing this today for money. Mm. Nobody. <laughs> there are a zillion other ways to make money, yeah. a lot more money, actually. Even when you have a massive hit, if you had put, you, you know, you have a massive hit, it's taken you tw 10 years, 20 years to find it. If you had spent 10 to 20 years in real estate, hedge funds, whatever it is, you probably have more money. Mm -hmm. So the idea that, you know, greedy producers, no, no, no. Yes, we want to make money. Usually we want to make money just so that we can do it again. Right. Like uh, it is my like goal to recoup my shows fast. So my investors will invest in my next show. That's yeah. it. I just want to produce more theater. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, going back to the mentors, the current present day mentors for a second. Are, is there any like standout advice that you've received? Anything that like just comes to the front of your mind? Well, in the past couple of years, in the past 12 months, that focus in your forties, uh, quote there yeah. that was direct from uh, a mentor of mine who was very helpful in getting me to like what do you want what do you want you yeah. want a hamilton you want to lay miz you want to rent well focus on finding that and only that uh -huh. and start to do away with some of the other stuff so that that's been a real that's been a real big one a recent one so that's the other thing you know i think is very important for everyone out there no matter where you are in your career, you never stop learning. You never stop adjusting. Mm -hmm. You pivot when something isn't working. Uh, it's not like, oh, great, I got a Tony Award, and now I'm just going to sit back and just, uh-uh. This is actually when the real work begins. Mm. Yeah. How do you begin your day? Well, another big change in my life, I get up at 5 o'clock in the morning. I... I go to my version of a gym, which is a golf driving range in New York City inside, and I hit about 50 to 100 golf balls every morning. Wow. Uh, and then I'm in my office by about 7, 7.30. Uh, and then I have a pretty good routine. I post an Instagram whiteboard quote for all my Instagram followers, but also for me. I uh, have the same healthy breakfast. I do a lot. I meditate for a little bit. I really try to prep my day. The mornings are very productive time for actually all humans. Um, and especially for me. So I try to get a jump start on my day that way. And do you do you get to meditate daily? Or is yeah, that... it's something that's a necessary part now. About like how long? 
It ranges, you know, okay. it's not long. It doesn't take, you know, 10 minutes, five minutes, yeah. 12 minutes, something just to reset yourself. It's yeah. A, yeah. I recently started that myself and it really changes the day when you take five or 10 minutes for yourself. It's incredible how it just sets you up for, it sets you up for success. Is there a text you refer to daily? Like a, like reading a book or a, quote, a, a book. No, it's anything. new quote. So that's what the Instagram thing is about. Like I am actually a, like I listen to a lot of audio books. I'm a big audio book guy, yeah. but I listen to entrepreneurial, inspirational, self helpy, like all that stuff. I find walking down the street and listening to um, those kind of folks yeah. uh, can be exceptionally helpful. So I do that, and then I usually, again, will I post a quote on my whiteboard, which I have to stare at every day. It's the, I'm looking at it right now over your head. So I'll put find a new quote, and um, I will take a picture of it, throw it on Instagram, but it's also for me to stare at every day and, and remind. Uh, I was feeling a little nervous about something this morning, so I found a quote about that. The quote today was, the great majority of what gives you angst never happens, so you must evict it. So... I stare at that every day and remind myself, oh, right, stop worrying, you idiot. Just don't worry about it. It's going to be fine. Yeah. I love that. Who are you when you're at your best? Who am I when I'm at my best? I'm at my best when I'm actually, I think, we're all at our best when, our, when we're at our true selves, yeah. when we're our true selves, which is not worrying, not anxious, just doing what we're supposed to do, what we want to do. Uh, again, like you were when you were five years old, mm -hmm. you just do it. You don't think about it. And it is more challenging the older you get and actually the more successful you have because you do feel, oh, there are more people looking at me now. There are more people. Uh, I have to deliver. <laughs> yeah. I just won a Tony Award. Oh, my God. Now, like the next show, what are they going to oh, God, just get <laughs> over it. Just get over it. No one really cares as much as you think they care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the irony. No one's thinking about it right now. Just you. So oh, get over it. Yeah. There's a great quote I heard from an entrepreneur who was talking about marketing. And he was someone was obsessing about their product or selling the product or their email, whatever. And he was like, you know what the great truth is? No one cares about your shit as much as you think they do. They huh. just don't. You're a, you think everyone's staring at you or thinking about your product right now or whatever. They're not. They're yeah. not. You just have to get over it. Get out of your own brain. Yeah. That's the quote. How do you view happiness? Have, well, happiness is... Look, I find happiness doing what you want to do. Again, and doing what you love to do unencumbered by anything else it's just you're like i'm gonna do this because i want to do this right now yeah and that's just that makes you content it makes you happy yeah yeah i agree with that what what advice would you give a smart driven college student about to enter the workforce i know there's not one piece of advice to give so it's a loaded question i'm curious if something comes to mind well i will talk about the thing that i didn't do more of which is I didn't look to build a network of people like me oh. around myself. I actually went to NYU. I didn't find, find that I fit in there. Uh, and so I just went to my room and I started writing shows or writing plays or I would come up to see lots of shows and learn. And instead of really trying to say, okay, I don't fit in in this classroom with these people. I find they're a little bit different than me. They want different things. Okay. Instead of saying, where are the effing people like me? Mm. I just retreated a bit. And I would, because I'm, a, ironically, I'm a bit of an introvert. So I retreated instead of going out there and, and trying to find the people like yourself because they are out there. Yeah. yeah. It's one of the reasons, we, you know, I started a blog and a podcast basically to say, you're not the only one think about like and then we created this membership community called the producers perspective pro which is all about saying to people like you're not the only one there's a whole bunch of other people out there that want to do what you do and are really gung-ho about it come meet other people you'll actually achieve more when you're surrounded by other people that want to do what you do yeah do you have a a favorite failure or a parent failure that set you up for success 
Well, you fail all the time. I mean, you know, the, the truth, the, the, <laughs> you never stop failing. Yeah. yeah. That's the one way to not succeed is to stop failing uh, because you have to try things. You know, one of my favorite stories about that is Edison had thousands and thousands of patents. Mm. We remember him for the light bulb. Yeah. Right. Like it's that type of thing. You have to fail all the time. So, yeah, I, I, you know, one of my most favorite failures was on the awesome 80. This is a small one, but the awesome 80s prom where I, I had a marketer call me, someone on the street, uh, uh, saying, I've got 10 people that want to buy tickets to your show, but they want seating on it and they, they don't want to pay the like hundred dollar price, but they'll pay $50. And I was like, well, no, the hundred dollar price, that's the price. That's I didn't negotiate. I didn't, I, I had sold like four tickets for the performance that night. Mm -hmm. This guy was willing to bring in 10. I wasn't malleable. I wasn't thinking just negotiate, just be flexible, get anybody in. Mm -hmm. That's one. And then whenever I, and I've made this mistake too, whenever I try to do something just because I think it will make money, it never works. Interesting. Never works. Is that because there's no like heart and soul behind it? Yeah, you have to be passionate about your ideas. And I think people can see through commercial efforts, things yeah. that are just, again, solely done for commercial reasons. I think audiences are wise to that. It comes out in the, in the story. Yeah. I think you have to do something because of, you believe that, and this is a, not only a theatrical entrepreneurial statement, but an entrepreneurial statement in general. Create a product because you think it's going to make people's lives better. That's how you build a success. Mm -hmm. And whether that means you're going to make them laugh, make them cry, make them you know, go ahead and write their politician, whatever, it doesn't matter what the end result is, but it's going to make their lives better. Yeah. That's how you, you have to think about other people. It's just like life, right? Kindness, happiness. Think about other people first before you think about yourself. You're much more likely to get success. Yeah. Yeah. That was another point you brought up in, a, in another interview as well, that the big successes on Broadway aren't because of the stars. It's never a star driven show. It's the content, the story itself, the message, the heart, what you just said, which is great. Um, is there a common piece of incorrect advice you hear often in your field? Well, the, the, actually, that, that is part of it. You know, I think people, this is a very risky business, very risky endeavor. And then I think people are trying to find safe roads all the time. Yeah. Oh, do this because it's a star in it, because it's this. Well, that doesn't necessarily guarantee success. And I think people are always trying to game the mm -hmm. system of like, oh, it's based on this movie or it's based on this, it's this. And it's like, okay, you're right. That can mitigate risk. There's no question, pre-existing brand. But actually the biggest successes we have have been things that, you look, Les Mis, the worst title on the history of the planet. No one still can't pronounce the damn thing. <laughs> yeah. But the story, and it was so unique. Um, so it's, you know, I think that's the, the most incorrect advice I hear whispered about. Like when investors come to me, I wrote a blog about this. Investors, the, the most common question I get asked from investors in the theater is, who's in it? Who's in it? Because they're looking for a star. Yeah. The fact of the matter is the biggest, the best way to find big success on Broadway is to have no star. Mm. Nine out of the 10 longest running shows of all time were starless. They actually made stars. So as an investor in the theater, who's in it should be your last question. Hmm. Doesn't have anything to do with big success. Yes, you could do a limited run revival of a play and squeak out 4% profit maybe in 14 weeks or whatever it is. But that's not, if you want that, again, invest in a real estate trust or something. That's not what people are trying to do here. You know, <laughs> That's not what's happening here. <laughs> no. Is there a best, most worthwhile investment you've made? Be a time, skill set, yeah, money? Yeah, my, my blog, without a doubt. Why? My, my blog, without a doubt, changed my business, changed my life. I became a better writer as a result. I became a better thinker as a result. I listened. I, I got so many more comments, feedback. My, I started a conversation with so many audience members and theater makers, et cetera. Uh, I 
because of the blog, it led to the podcast, which allowed me to sit down with inc- in the chair that you're in right now with incredible, incredible people, mm. um, you know, really masters of the art form. And I, you know, my podcast, I just learn from people, mm. you know, audience members love it. I'm grabbing, but I just, I, I just learned. So starting that blog when I did over 10 years ago, without a doubt was the, the best thing that I could have done. Yeah. Do you have any, um, most gifted books? Or favorite books? Yeah, Influenced by Dr. Robert Cialdini, which is a study of why people do the things they do. Mm. Uh, and it's it's really a marketing book, yeah. but it will teach you a lot about life. Okay. And as we're wrapping up here, I am curious, metaphorically speaking, is there a word, a phrase, or a quote that you could put on a billboard for millions of people to see? You're a Tim Ferriss fan. I, I, I see. I am a big <laughs> Tim Ferriss fan. His mentor's book is right over there. Oh, how far are you along? <laughs> oh, I, I, I pick it up from time to time just to get a little juice. It's large. <laughs> uh, the quote on the billboard for me, you know, it. I'm, I, I wrote a book myself on how to succeed in the arts or in anything, and yeah. it's just about, you know, I, I, for me, it's just take action whatever that is, because so much good can come from getting off your chair, doing something, putting pen to paper, or I guess I'll do this. I'll, I'll say this because this is a little bit more specific. I have an entrepreneurial phrase that I teach a lot, um, which is serve the tennis ball. I believe that all entrepreneurs have to start the game. It is your responsibility to serve the tennis ball. Okay. You can can't sit back and wait for someone to say, do you want to play yeah. here? I'll hit the ball to you. If you want to create a show, act in a show, start a restaurant, write a novel, whatever it is you want to do, you have to start the game. All that I do all day long is serve the tennis ball. I call investors. Do you want to invest in this show? I call movie companies. Can I get the rights to this movie? I, I call a director. What ideas do you have? That director, most people in the world, most people will not reach out to you, no matter how brilliant they may be. There's another great quote by the creator of uh, The Walking Dead who said when he kind of burst out into the scene when he was like adapting The Green Mile or something, he said... Someone asked him, oh, you're so talented, you just burst on the scene. And he said, let me get something straight. There are a lot more talented screenwriters working at Burger Kings all over this country. Huh. I just put my idea to paper. Yeah. He served the tennis ball. And that's, I think, what I'd put on my billboard. Yeah, I really like that. Thanks for chatting with me. My pleasure. This Thanks for having been, me. This has been great. Where can we find you? The best place to go to is the blog, theproducersperspective.com, or just Google Ken Davenport, and uh, you'll find me. This is incredible. Ken, thank you so much for sitting down with me. Ladies and gentlemen, Ken Davenport. You've been listening to Entertainment X, the podcast. You can follow Entertainment X on Instagram at underscore Entertainment X underscore. If you haven't yet, go to Apple Podcasts and subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. Join Clay next week for another Curiosity Conversation on Entertainment X. Thank you for listening. <laughs>